Good morning. Oh, oh, y'all wonder where I'm at, aren't you? Um, I'm going to start with, a, and this is a last minute thing, so I'm going to start it from back here. If Miss Lina will listen for a minute, bless her heart. She don't never hear me talking. Um, this is what, and I'm just going to start with a little humor this morning, if y'all will just humor me for a minute. Um, as when I, the kids were sitting right here, and I told them, I said, y'all need to get up now, Mr. Miller, Miss Peggy going to be in a minute. And I happened to look up, they're sitting on the other side over there. So if they don't act like they're listening this morning, it's because you can't hear from, you, you can't sit on the opposite side, you know. But they were sweet. They just moved right on over there. Didn't bother them a bit. But I want I want to share this song with y'all. And like I say, it's humorous. It it, it just enjoy it. <laughs> Just a while back with a couple of high school friends And on Sunday morning I wanted to find a church to worship in So I packed my truck and I headed out I saw it in a cloud of dust It was the Ebenezer Fellowship Non-denominational Baptocostal Free Will Church When I walked in it was time to start And that little church was packed There was only one seat on the very front row took a seat, a hush fell over the place, as a sweet little gray-haired woman walked up and said, boy, I got something to say. Folks around here call me granny, I'm as sweet as I can be. Well, I volunteer for everything that couldn't make it without me. I teach Sunday school, I sew and bake, while me living in charge of the Christmas play. And there's only one thing I ask in return, a lesson you should learn. Don't sit in my pew. You know, it belongs to me. I'm going to sit right here at least four years, and that's the way it's going to be. I can tell that you are new around here, so you better get one thing clear. If you know what's good for you, don't sit in my pew. Well, and handed me a brown, ice-cold, metal folding chair. So I sat out there in the aisle and I listened to the choir as they sang, I shall not be moved. And then the preacher looked at me and he said, now we want our special guest to stay when the service is over with for some of Granny's red velvet cake. And that's what I did. But just about the time they said the blessing, I looked down and noticed I didn't have a fork. Well, I figured I'd made enough commotion for one day, so I thought, I'm going to ease an air in the kitchen, and I'm going to find the utensil drawer and help myself. And that's what I did. But just about the time I located that drawer, guess who spun me around? Them Granny, stay out of my kitchen, boy. Space. Don't sing so loud. Wear a coat and tie. Come early enough for Sunday school. Stay out of my kitchen. But most of all, I can tell that you are new around here, so you better get one thing clear. Here we go, y'all. If you know what's good for you, say with me. Don't sit in my view. But just remember, Granny loves you. interesting instrument. It, you know, it, it amazes me. It, it seems like that just... I hear better. I'm telling you. When I used to sit over here all the time, one day I got it moved over there, and I'm telling you, it sounded different. It was different. I don't know what it is, but um, I, I am glad that we are ones that we don't, you know, come in here and say, get out, I pew. But uh, I just had to share a little humor. <laughs> We just need to sit down with them or just sit down somewhere else. It's all good. It's all right. And Lord, help if somebody does go get a fork. Help yourself. Make yourself at home. But 
Shit, that's exactly right. Um, but I just I had to share a little humor with that because that that's that's just a little humor there. Um, but uh, all right, well we're gonna start. By, I brought some visitors with me this morning, and uh, I'm um. Come here, both of you. I brought some visitors with me. Y'all tell y'all all the time about the concerts that go on in my car. No, I'm not gonna make you sing in the microphone. Y'all just gonna help me up here. So. This is one of their new favorite songs, and when it does come on, the phones go down the, uh, voluntarily. Woohoo! That's a miracle in itself. Um, and the voices come on. So um, we're going to start, y'all. We're going to. Yep. That grave robber. <laughs> um, so um, I want you to stand up and, and worship with them. We're going we're gonna to let them. Uh, and into the light, Father. This I pray today as we worship, Father, as we study this morning, that we will not be spiritually blinded, Father, today or any other day, Father. Just help us to see the light, that Jesus is the light and the way, Father, the truth and the light, Father. Just thank you so much for Christ and his work on the cross, that we are pardoned from our sin through repentance and our faith in him, Father. Just pray that you will be glorified and honored this morning as we sing and listen and and worship, Father, just pray that you'd be with Brother Mike as he brings the message this morning, Father. It be the words we need to hear, 
just pray that you would open our hearts and minds and we would be receptive to your word and your truth for all of these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus amen to the other extreme I don't know what's more all over the place this morning Could you fall so far? You should be ashamed of yourself. So I was ashamed of myself. The lies I believed. They got some roots they run deep. I let them take a hold of my life. I let them take control of my life. Standing in your presence, Lord, I can feel you digging all the roots up.
same cover on both of them. It should be open, I think. But um, It's 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We have Sunday school, uh, 11 o'clock morning worship in here, and at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights on Facebook Live, we have Bible study. Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we have prayer meeting and Bible study. Um, don't forget that Friday, June the 14th, is Flag Day, and Sunday, next Sunday, is Father's Day. Just a reminder on those. Um, Wednesday the 19th will be Deacon's Meeting and Business Meeting. And Sunday the 30th, we are planning an eating meeting. We had not had one of those in a while, so if you had not been staying, and uh, try to stay. If you have been staying, definitely make plans to stay anyway. So, um, we'll have that on Sunday, June the 30th. And birthdays, Miss Marianne, did you have a good birthday? Good. And best wishes. Um... Miss Peggy and Miss Lee, and y'all got another week in a day, right? I'm looking right there. For, <laughs> I'm looking right there. They're over there. <laughs> See, it just messes me up because I'll be looking like, who's not here? Um, another week for y'all, but then it'll be time to celebrate y'all too. And um, then Langston's got a birthday the next week. So, um, And Mom and Wendell have an anniversary on Tuesday. 36 years. Yeah, she always takes a year off, though, every year. She don't count that first one for some reason, but anyway. Um, but they are, um, they're having an anniversary weekend this weekend, so I guess. But, um, anyway, so um, let's go on into our offertory hymn. And it's going to be on the screen. And if y'all will stand, uh, four verses.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this day, Father, and this opportunity to be in your house this morning and be in your presence as we always are, Father. Just thank you again for all the blessings you give us, Father. Thank you for your immeasurable riches of grace and mercy, Father. Just pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings as we give back a small portion of what you so richly bless us with, Father. Just pray that you would use them for the furtherance of your kingdom and the spread of the gospel and the light of Christ, Father. Just pray that you be with Brother Mike. As he brings the message this morning, Father, just that your Holy Spirit would speak the words of truth through him, Father, that we would be receptive to hear your word, and we would take it, go out and use it, and, uh, and help further your gospel, Father, to enlighten people about the good news of Jesus. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I did forget to read a thank you card that we got. Um, it says, the family of Donna Marie Brewer wishes to express deep appreciation and sincere thanks for your kind expression of sympathy. Thanks the Brewer family. It says, thank you for your donation, prayers, and support. God bless you. You got me up? There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. How is everybody? Y'all had a good week, I hope. Just don't go to the beach. There's sharks. Yeah. Y'all seen that, what, three attacked at Panama City down through there? Yeah. So don't go to the beach and get in the water. That, that's your tip for the day. <laughs> All right. Like I said, I hope everybody's had a good week. Um, and I did not post a version link on Facebook, so you're going to have to go to the events and find it. Um, all right. Remember, my theme for this year is God's wisdom. So last week, we started looking at Hebrews, and we're going to continue this week with chapter 2. Um, but I want to start you with a quote. As a matter of fact, if you examined 100 people who had lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them would turn out to have been reasoned out of it by honesty, by an honest argument. Do not most people simply drift away? C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity. But you think about it. How many people just drift away from their faith for whatever reason? And scripture will be up there this morning, most of it. Um, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles or your apps, um, I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 2. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received, it's just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore a great, ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, 
about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you are careful for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. I'm bringing many sons and daughters to glory. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, he says. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly I will sing your praises. And again I will put my trust in him. And again he says, here I am and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to become like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for their sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Aren't we blessed to have such a Savior? The writer challenges the original readers to pay attention to the truth they heard so as not to drift away into false teachings. And even today, it's so easy to get caught up in that and to drift because there, there are so many false teachings. There are so many pastors that are, are teaching the woke version or the politically correct version of the Bible or a Bible version that it suits people, the version that people want to hear, not the true version. So we've got to be careful of that, that we don't get caught up in that and we don't drift away. Pay most careful attention means to diligently apply one's mind to the message of Christ. Using nautical expressions, the writer urges readers to take the teachings of Jesus seriously rather than to drift away from the truth like a boat that has broken free of its moorings. And that's one of their nautical terms. Basically, that's where the boat's tied up at. And when it breaks free, what does it do? It begins to drift. Early believers were in danger of falling away from following Jesus. They had heard the gospel, but it had not sank in. People who are raised in families that believe in Christ have the same risk today. There are many today that have heard the gospel and more or less agree to parts of it, maybe not all of it because they don't like what it has to say or what it says they can't do. But doesn't mean they are committed to a relationship with Christ. Folks, that's key. You have got to have a relationship with Christ. That means reading God's word every day. Spending time in prayer every day. You need to be involved in a church. You need to be serving. You need to have that relationship with Christ. That is crucial. The Jews had the Old Testament and the promise of the Messiah. Christians have Jesus, the living word, and the witnesses of those who hear Jesus or who heard Jesus during his earthly ministries. All of those eyewitnesses testify to what they heard. The message God delivered through the angels reflects the teachings of the angels as messengers for God. This would bring to mind the Old Testament law since the angels were present at the giving of the law to Moses. In Galatians 3.19, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Jesus is greater than the angels and is the only way to the Father. 
No one will escape God's punishment if they disregard the salvation offered by Christ. If there were no consequences for disobeying the Old Testament law, how much greater will the consequences be for refusing Christ and the gospel? Eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry had handed down his teachings to the readers of Hebrews. These readers were believers who had not seen Jesus in the flesh. Just like them, we have not seen Jesus personally. We base our belief and our faith on the eyewitness accounts recorded in the Bible, which we know to be the truth. In John 20, 29, why then was the law given at all? Hey, wait a minute. I just read that. Nope. It's the wrong scripture. You know what? That's the exact same thing. John 20, 29 says, Then Jesus told them, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have be uh, believed. I think the gremlins got into my sermon, because I know I didn't put that in there twice. <laughs> Is it? It shouldn't, because I went well, because I because I, <laughs> I went through last night and compared the PowerPoint to what was in there, so I don't know what's going on with it. Uh, I guess the gremlins took a break from that and messing with that. But here's a quick recap: the Jews, as followers of the law, understand the literal and severe commands of the law, such as an eye for an eye, etc. They diligently practiced the death penalty. It was a harsh religion that clearly emphasized that sin carries penalties. Furthermore, as the men of old received revelation from God, often it was given through angels. The promises and judgment given by the angels proved unalterable. Judgments came and promises were fulfilled. Therefore, if it is indeed true that salvation is found in faith in Jesus Christ, the penalty for rejecting Christ should be assumed be likewise severe, if not more so. If the angels' words were unchangeable, how much more the words of Christ? As such, it is imperative for the Jews and for every person to pay close attention to what we have heard in the Old Testament through Christ and in the New Testament Scripture so that we don't drift away from it. Eternal ramifications exist depending upon what we do with Christ. The phrase signs and wonders in this context refers to the divine confirmation that bore witness to the word of God and assured it is true. Today, there is no need for signs and wonders, although many in society today would like them to testify to the truth of God's word. God now bears witness through the Holy Spirit and his word. But you know what's bad? Even if there were signs, people would still not believe. They still wouldn't believe Jesus was real. In Mark 16, 20, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Salvation was preached by Jesus as he walked this earth. After he died and rose again, he revealed himself to the 12 disciples and the 500. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. God bestowed gifts upon the disciples to do good works, as God willed, never according to their own fleshly wills. These miracles were evidence that God had indeed come to indwell his people in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that the church had been born. And speaking about the world to come, the writer implies a contrast with another age, 
the one to come. In the world to come, the angels will not be in charge. But in the present age, they rule this world by ministering with God in a role above humans, but below God. Pulling from Psalms 8, the author makes the point that part of God's plan and design is to subject all things to Christ. Psalm 8, 4, and 6, 4 through 6. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. You see, as humans, we're a little lower than the angels in many ways. Humans are physical beings, and angels are spiritual beings. Humans are subject to death, but angels are not. Humans are bound by time and space, but angels are not. And in this age, humans are bound to earth, but angels are not. In the original plan of God, humans were second only to the angels in his creative hierarchy. God intended that humanity should have universal domination, that all things would be subject to them. However, a little incident with Adam and Eve postponed God's plan. Right now, Jesus rules over creation. But one day, God will restore humanity to its intended place of authority. The saints will one day reign with Christ in the world to come. It is not for the angels to rule, but Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under his feet, under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in. In order for humanity to be restored to God's original intent, God had to intervene. God's own son had to become a man lower than the angels for a little while and taste, fully experience, death for every individual. In Romans 5, 17, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life? through the one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus, though he is God, also needed to be made for a time lower than the angels as he took on human flesh. This was so that he could die in our stead as the perfect sacrifice. Now he is crowned with glory and honor, having by the grace of God tasted death for everyone. And those that believe will have the promise of reigning in eternity with Jesus. God's grace for us led Jesus to his death. Jesus came into the world to suffer and die so that we could have eternal life, bringing many children into glory. Union with God was shattered by the sin of the first Adam and could not be restored without suffering, the suffering of Jesus. Jesus was made the perfect pioneer of our salvation through his suffering. Jesus did not need to suffer for his own salvation because he was God in human form. But Jesus perfectly obeyed God through his own painful crucifixion to finalize our salvation. Our suffering as servants of God can make us more sensitive to the needs of others. People who have dealt with pain are able to reach out with compassion to others who hurt. We can use our own experiences to help others who are hurting and suffering. When we suffer, we carry on Jesus' work. God's delight and plan was to bring many sons and daughters to glory through knowing and loving him. This was why he created Adam and Eve to begin with. It was for love, not because God needed something in addition to himself. Rather, he wanted to share his goodness and sufficiency with them. Though mankind fell into sin, through Christ, they can be restored into the right fellowship with God and receive the promise of eternal life. All things exist for Jesus since he is God. If God didn't want things to exist, then they wouldn't, right? 
God created everything. As he walked this earth and died for sin, his suffering was great. As he endured it faithfully without sinning, it proved that he was indeed God and the perfect sacrifice. Believers are made holy at the moment of salvation, but God also progressively sanctifies us through the Holy Spirit as we grow in our faith and relationship with Christ. If you don't have that relationship, you're not going to grow. Although Christians participate in the process of sanctification by reading and obeying God's word, we ultimately increase in holiness through the work of God. In Romans 8, 29, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Have you ever noticed before the crucifixion, Jesus called his followers disciples and friends, not brothers and sisters. The cross changed all of that. When Jesus saw Mary on the day of his resurrection, he told her, go and tell my brothers in Matthew 28, 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And by using this term, the writer of Hebrews, it shows Jesus' willingness to identify with people in their humanity and suffering. This challenges us to consider who we are, members of God's family. Jesus delivered us from eternal death and freed us to live with him. When we belong to God, we need not fear death because we know death opens the door into eternal life. Jesus defeated death, so we have hope in the victory that Christ brings. When someone has, more, when someone has a more powerful weapon than their enemy, the enemy's weapons become useless. Satan's weapon, the power of death, was destroyed with God's weapon of eternal life through Christ, incarnation, flesh and blood. Death and resurrection in 1 John 3 8 the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work through salvation in Christ we are adopted into the family of God being made brothers and sisters of him all sons and daughters of the Father and since we are made up of human flesh and blood, Jesus had to partake of the same and die as a man in order to free us from the devil's hold and from sin. Christ's victory over sin and death rendered the devil powerless for those who would believe and trust in the name of Christ. In the Old Testament, the high priest was the mediator between God and his people. Now we have Jesus as our high priest. He bridges the gap between us and the Father. Having lived a human life, he understands our weaknesses. He has for once and all paid the penalty for our sins by his own sacrificial death, and he has restored our broken relationship with God. We are released from sin's dominion and controlling power when we commit ourselves fully to a relationship with Christ trusting in what he has done for us. Here again, committing into a relationship with Christ, fully surrendering, giving it to him, and having that relationship. Christ didn't come to die in the form of an angel for the angels, but he came as a man to die for us, to die for mankind, the descendants of Abraham who God had promised to him. Knowing that Jesus suffered pain and faced temptations, helps us face our trials. Jesus understands and emphasizes, empathizes with our struggles because he faced them as a human. You look at what Jesus went through. So we can trust him to help us survive our own suffering and overcome temptation. And when we face trials, we must turn to Jesus for strength and patience. He knows what we need. And he'll be there to help us. It may not be in the way that we want, 
but he knows best. We just got to trust him and not give up. And by having endured life in human flesh, Jesus is a merciful high priest for us. Since he was tempted in the same things in which we are tempted, and since he suffered in the same ways that we suffer, he is able to come to our aid and deliver us from evil. He is both a faithful and merciful Savior, having shed his blood as a sacrifice for our sins. I'll close with another quote. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerless and delude ourselves into thinking we escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. D.A. Carson, and for the love of God. Folks, like I said, that relationship is key. Jesus died for us. We're part of his family. We're sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. Got to have that relationship. And we, we need to be doing what God has called us to do. Folks, we got to get outside the, the, the walls of the building and be the church outside of these four walls. We've got to, we've got to plant those seeds. We, we've got to share the gospel. We can't be afraid to talk to others about what we believe in. Like I talked about before, what's the worst they're going to tell you? No. Okay, fine. They tell you no, say, well, I'm still going to pray for you. I'm still going to love you because Jesus loves you. In case you hadn't noticed, we live in a very broken, very fallen world. And if we don't step up and do our part, uh, you know, it, it's crucial. Um, I can't stress that enough, having that relationship. It, it, it's not that difficult to, to open the Bible or open your app um, and, and spend some time reading God's Word. It's not that hard to spend a little time in prayer. Um, he suffered for us. Why can't we suffer a little bit of time for him? You should be eager and excited to want to spend time with the Lord. I don't care if it's in the morning. I don't care if it's at night. I don't care if it's in the middle of the day. Spend time with the Lord. I took a funny picture the other night. My cat was reading the Bible. Seriously. I got the picture. I mean, I had the Bible open. And next thing I know, the cat's reading the Bible. And I think he was praying, too, because the next thing he had his head down with his eyes closed. I don't know. Maybe it was a sign to me, but it, it really spoke to me, so I had to take a picture of it. Um, so just, just take the time. Work on that relationship. Let's do our part. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to bring the message this morning, Father, as, as we study through Hebrews and... Uh, gain the wisdom and knowledge that, that it contains to, to help us in our spiritual journey and our walk. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord. Let us take time to listen so we can hear, to see what he shows and to reveal, to spend that time each day getting to know you and you to know us, to build our relationship, to constantly strive to know more, to constantly want to serve you and to do what you've called us to do. Lord, we're grateful for the sufferings of your son, Jesus, for all that he done so that we could be free and not have to pay the penalty. So let us do our part to give him all the honor and the glory that he so deserves. Lord, I ask for your protection, your wisdom, your guidance, and your knowledge. Lord, so many here in our church, our own families, and our community need the healing, the restoration that can only come from you. So, Lord, I ask that if it's your will, that you would lay your hands upon these individuals, Father, completely restore their health, take away any pain, any disease, any sickness, any sufferings, and completely restore them. Lord, strengthen them, 
Give them hope, peace, comfort, and faith. Lord, for those that may have unspoken prayers, those that may be in a difficult time right now, those that may be struggling, those that may be in a dark place, Father, if it's your will, bless them, provide for them, guide and lead them, be the light into the darkness, Father. Strengthen them, give them hope, comfort. Lord, let us love as we're called to love. Let us go out and share that love with others to let them know that they are loved. That they're loved by Jesus. They're loved by us. Let us plant those seeds so lives may be changed and souls may be saved. Let us brighten somebody's day. Put them before us, Father. Maybe it's a simple offer of prayer. Lord, thank you for the blessings upon our church. Thank you for all that you do for us, Father. We love you and we are forever grateful. I ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.
prayer requests, praise reports. Brother Miller, will you do the honors and dismiss us?